Welcome everyone. Let us know in the chat box who is joining us and perhaps we can get a few shout outs in. My name is Dr. Natasha Kroom and I'm an assistant professor of higher education at Clemson University as well as your host for the ASH 2018 Woke Research Methodology Series. Under the presidential leadership of Indiana University professor, Dr. Lori Patton Davis, the theme for the Association for the Study of Higher Education 2018 annual conference is Envisioning the Woke Academy. The series is among several efforts to realize the theme and call attention to the need for more critical exploration of policies, practices, and experiences of people across, across post-secondary contexts. This series is designed to encourage us to consider the current state of higher education research and the extent to which our current body of knowledge and inquiry practices are, in a simple word, woke. Before we move into the interview, let me share some logistics. We ask that all attendees make sure your devices are set to mute. We have several hundred registrants for this webinar and want to make sure that we have as little background noise as possible. The first half of this discussion is organized around a predetermined set of questions for Dr. Bacharya. While the second half will serve as an opportunity to take questions and comments for the audience, please use the chat option on the bottom of the screen to type in your questions. We will be monitoring them throughout the webinar and we'll get to what we can during the latter part of the webinar. And we see that folks are already in. We've got CU Denver, um, I see Sam Houston State's in the building and, a, and quite a few others. We of course welcome your thoughts via social media as well. Please use hashtag ASH2018 or hashtag the Woke Academy to interact with us via Twitter. Thank you for joining us for the second episode featuring Dr. Kakali Bhattacharya. Dr. Kakali Bhattacharya has never climbed Mount Everest or wrestled an alligator or won an Academy Award for Best Choreography. She has won some national and international awards for writing books and for outstanding mentoring and research and other stuff which we think you can find out about through Google and ResearchGate. In the future, she wants to bring Pluto back into the family because it's lonely out in space. Kakli, welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me and that wonderful introduction. Lori <laughs> says that's one bombing book. <laughs> hey, <Dr. laughs> All right, let's. You know, I'm breaking the mastery house, so I figured, you know, like instead of saying what I have done, I might as well say what I have not done, you know? Yes. Let's start with a question that's central to this series. When you hear the idea of woke research, what does it elicit for you? You know, um, it's a really interesting question and I, you know, I'm, I'm about an hour behind from you guys. So I, I can say I'm not that woke at the moment as you guys are, you know, since I'm CSD and you guys are ESD. But, you know, when I think about woke, um, it's, a, it's a very multifaceted word. I mean, it's, it has a cultural um, origination and I found that it had gotten co-opted by multiple other groups. And, and when it gets co-opted, people think um, they have arrived, you know, like they have some sense of, um, complacency around it or they get some street cred for doing social justice work because I'm woke I'm doing woke stuff you know and sometimes that can be detrimental because I'm not sure that we are really that woke you know um, because the structures within which we are in continuously morph so when we when we become woke to challenge them they morph the oppressive structures again and and it's sort of like a laying and you like peel these layers of onions and you look at your programming that has you know can continue to happen on your consciousness so much that you have enslaved yourself for years decades and generations so i don't know that you can really be so woke that you're an insomniac you know um i think it's a process of becoming uh, aware a process of being vigilant a process of um 
understanding that this is a lifelong unlearning and deprogramming process. And it takes practice, you know, so I do a lot of contemplative work. So when I think of woke, um, it also makes me think like, have we achieved enlightenment? You know, like, are we, are we the Buddha now, you know, because we're woke. And if, you, if we were to become Buddha, then we would need practice to get to that point, you know. So, so for, if anything, woke tells me like what might be some woke practices, what might be some woke methodologies that bring us to those moments of clarity and awareness and awakening and becoming and being, as opposed to like a, like a point of aware arrival, like a finite point of arrival. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so as you think about, and as you've shared with us this idea of, right, it's not this finite point of arrival, but rather this sort of ongoing process. And I love how you're, right, engaging us with the idea that as we are going through this process of awakening, like the system is also shifting to address, right, like our varying levels of, of wokeness. <laughs> and so as, um, as you have thought about your own journey and your own awakening and becoming aware of that process, how has that shifted your own work? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really solid question. Just to give you an example how the system shifts, right? So um, a lot of schools have uh, put um, a demand for what are the criteria for attaining tenure and promotion for professors, because there were so many structures that were invisible in higher education, disciplinary structures that, you know, in, enough consciousness was kind of put into place to say, hey, you can't make it so invisible, you're going to have to articulate that. So now we have faculty handbook that articulates some of the, some of the ways in which, you know, we need to navigate. And, and when our people are getting to those points, to those benchmark points, um, they add things like collegiality. You know, so that's how the structure shifts. They add things like collegiality. Now you have to kind of figure out what, what on earth collegiality means, you know? Are you the ang angry minority and therefore you're not collegial? Mm. Do you see what I'm saying? So then you're, you have to become complicit in your own oppression, but to say, well, that might go against my collegiality. So, so the system shifts because it figures out you have navigated and you have navigational skills and, and navigational literacy and you're training people that are coming behind you. So it needs to shift because it needs to preserve its own agenda, which is whiteness and white supremacy, you know? Um, yeah, somebody saying legality is a problem. Um, so in my own work, you know, when I first started working, um, I, my research was uh, focusing on invisible and visible structures uh, of oppression in higher education. And I looked at it from the perspective of people who had recently arrived from India as graduate students and that recent arrival um, is a very cool point of um, inquiry because it tells people like what looks different, you know? So when you go to another place, that first time you're there, you compare it to what you have known and then you identify what looks different versus those of us who are in the system for so long, we have become the, um, normalized within it and we don't see these things these are invisible to us some of these some of these structures of oppression have normalized and we just take it as status quo so when new people come in and say what is this this looks weird this looks different it wasn't something i was used to you identify those structures and it was a really complicated place to be because here i am a woman of color my committee was all white critical white folks you know but they were all white and i am critiquing higher education and asking them to give me a PhD for that. Right. So, so it, was, it was a very, very complicated position to be in. I mean, I had a faculty member ask me at my defense, so are you saying that white people are the problem, you know? So, so very direct questioning, you know? Um, so one of the things I, I reflected back on this question is that, am I, am I woke now because I have tenure and did I not speak up when I was a graduate student? And I don't think, I think people who want to do this work, do this work regardless of labels, modification, branding, because the call for this work is really strong, mm -hmm. you know? And, and if you trace back their work, you will see that that work has always been present. You know, our silence has never really got us anywhere, you know? Mm -hmm. So in my own work, I, I started doing, doing the research and I started presenting empirically and then I kind of stopped the empirical presentation of my work because I felt like I knew 
people and really do heavy decolonizing work, like really think about how I've been colonized in various educational systems and what does decolonizing mean before I continuously reproduce use my participants narratives for everybody else to consume mm -hmm. and because I do the work in my body that I that in which I do um, hey Abegunde sorry um, oh, because I do the work that I do um, in my body that means I'm always a third world broker you know I'm always explaining my people my culture as you know we're all representatives of our culture we all speak for everybody I speak for one billion people people you know I have that much power so um, so in, in that scenario, when I was, when I was uh, doing my work, you know, I, I felt like I didn't want to commodify my participants' narratives further, although people can read it if my dissertation is available uh, to download, but I decided that I really need to unpack the way we know and understand things, the way we do methodology, the way we construct things. And so my evolution and my work has become you know, more and more towards that. While I've done some empirical work since then, I've been very conservative about publishing the empirical work because I'm still sort of uh, unlearning some of the stuff, you know, that, and I, that I have been trained to. So a lot of my work recently has made my body the center of investigation, my experience the center of investigation, you know, as a way to write the narratives that I want to write, but put the gaze on me and not on the participants, you know, that I have worked with. So to do that, I have been coming up with a lot of decolonizing methodological moves, a lot of moves in, in um, in terms of theorizing decolonizing, what it might look like in the global north agenda of decolonizing. We talk a lot about land issues, and those are important issues to talk about, but I think like people that are kind of from other sort of colonizing histories and once colonizing um, countries have a very, very complex and other decolonizing agenda, you know, especially with language, for example, you know, we don't have language that in my country, we don't have language that everybody speaks universally unless it's English, you know? And so you have to think about, well, what do you lose when you lose language? You know, you lose so much. So I've been, I've been na navigating this theoretically and methodologically and conceptually and ethically to first sort of lay out a terrain for it. And it's only recently, I'm talking like as of AERA this year, that's how recent it is, that I re, entered the empirical space and crafted a decolonizing theory and and, uh, and started rereading my my empirical data through that theoretical lens so so that's kind of been my journey with higher education when i think about being woke I'm, for me it has been like doing a lot of unlearning and deprogramming that's the practice that i've been engaged in like what does this unlearning and deprogramming do and how do we do this um as well as realize we're always in relationship to a colonizing enterprise, which is you know academia and society at large. Yeah, I really appreciate you naming right this process of needing to unlearn and like that as a way of awakening oneself, right? Like doing that work. Um, you know, I was just in a well, it was really like more of an email exchange where a colleague sent. Um, one of these media pieces around, you know, how we're, how education is like totally jacking up the world because we have, you know, we have these in the, the language, like these leftist ideologies now. And all I could do was say, so are we assuming that what we're operating from and have been operating from and have been taught right, somehow does not have <laughs> particular ideological, epistemological perspectives? Can we talk about that? Of course, there was no response. But, but like, like, let's have that conversation around, like, we have all learned in particular systems. And so in order to, you know, engage in work that is um, critical decolonizing, awakening, right? Like that there needs to be this unlearning process. So I appreciate you highlighting that. Um, don't forget, uh, for those of you who are joining us, if you have questions, you can do that via Twitter. Um, you can also do that via the chat box. I see there are several folks joining us, UMKC, Syracuse, Bama, Florida State, Yukon, Oklahoma, Virginia Commonwealth. Let us know what your questions are. 
let's shift a little bit. So in a past conversation that you and I had, you identified yourself as a methodologist. So given your background experiences and the particular issues of inquiry that you've chosen to engage with, like why have you chosen to center higher education as a context in some of your work? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, yeah, so when I first started, I started in a program in University of Georgia called Research Evaluation Measurement and Statistics. And we were trained as methodologists, but we also needed to have a substantive area of interest. And it was, it was pretty, uh, pretty tough because even as a methodologist, I was, I was going towards qualitative methods as my uh, pull, you know? Um, and, and the reason of why it was my pull was because I read this book um, by Ruth Behar. And I, I joke and I say, Ruth Behar made me cry. And then she wrote about the vulnerable observer after that. You know, and I read about um, Translated Woman, where it was, um, she, she had a book on our ethnographic studies called Translated Woman. And in that book, she talked about a Mexican peddler who had gone through her life in, in uh, with so much challenges, lost, lost children, and was abused physically, mentally, sexually, you know, in a culture where she had become homeless and, and sometimes had support, sometimes didn't have support. And while it wasn't exactly my experience, it's, I had cultural distance from it, of course, you know, um, reading it, I was, I was weeping, I was in deep pain because I was bearing witness to a fellow human being entering and navigating life through so much challenges. And it shifted, like, so while Ruth is translating this woman's experiences, I'm getting translated by it as well. And, and, and I can never do the work that I thought I was going to do, you know, prior to, to that point, you know, I had my cultural background says that I have to be Dell, which is doctor, engineer, lawyer, or you're a loser, you know? So if I'm not Dell, <laughs> then at least I'd be doing some quantitative stuff, you know, and I was kind of still sort of moving and playing with this, with that idea. But then when I did that and I realized that I, 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 I didn't have a sense of place in academia at that time, and I still feel very unsettled in academia. Um, but at that time, I also didn't have a sense of place, and I knew that th there were things that were going on in higher education that I couldn't name pro properly, but I knew something was off. I didn't have the language, but I had the conscious awareness of something that was off. Mm -hmm. And so in order to sort of investigate that, um, I wasn't brave enough to do an autoethnography at that time, you know, because autoethnography is the hardest form of qualitative research that one can do, and it makes you really vulnerable. It's so much more than just doing dear diary type of work or navel gazing. Although, you know, Caroline Ellis said, we should be gazing at our navel, powerful stuff happens from our navel, you know, and <laughs> the umbilical cord comes out, there's birth stuff coming out of our navel. So maybe it's not a bad idea. But, uh, um, but um, you know, at that point, I thought, what if I, what if I talk to people that are uh, much more recently arrived in higher education who could name some of the things that I feel like it's not right, but I can't fully pinpoint it. And so that's what sort of uh, put me in that space where I started looking at higher education as a social context of education and, and then started looking at, you know, these people's experiences. And from then, you know, I just continuously build you know, into it because it felt it was relevant. It was relevant to do that. And it also was relevant because um, it also disrupted how we understood the racialization on a very simplistic uh, binary of black and white, as you know, we have talked about that, you know, because the, the, the oppressive structures that operate on us you know, are operating on us as, as not white and as, as uh, people who have disability and sexual orientation and, and other forms of minoritization. Mm -hmm. So to think, of, to think of oppression or racialized oppression, and, you know, in, in sort of those sort of monolithic terms was problematic for me. So I wanted to articulate that, you know, things don't have to reach always the threshold of bodies on the ground. All the bodies on the ground is very horrible threshold to reach, absolutely horrible threshold to reach. But there are points prior to that that we can also look at and disrupt and dismantle so that we don't get to the bodies on the ground threshold to say, let's be it now, you know? So that was one of the reasons why I chose the population that I chose to work with. 
And, um, and I also felt like I needed to work with this, this extremely large population of uh, people that are international students and inhabitants of um, universities in the US, you know, and, and there has to be some way of talking about the, their experiences, even if it doesn't fit the way we understand, you know, racialization. Yeah, I love it, all of it. I mean, I, I was actually uh, sharing with Berenice before we got on that you and I were basically on the phone for like three hours on Monday because um, you're giving us a lot, okay? Um, I'm going to move us to the next question because I want to have, make sure we have time to take questions from our um, audience. And again, hey, I see Texas Rio Grande Valley in the building, Cal State LA, University of Toronto, Maryland, PV, Prairie View A&M. Keep those questions coming, we're keeping track of them. So as you think, um, Kakali, about your own preparation to engage in or do research and some of this you've talked about, um, but maybe now you can provide us more directly with some germane advice about, right, like for those of us grappling with what doing research and engaging in scholarship means, both in academe and beyond, um, particularly, and you and I talked a little bit about this idea of like having culturally grounded inquiry practices. So what kind of advice would you have for those of us engaging in research and scholarship, and particularly if the goal is to be culturally grounded. Right. Um, you know, um, one, one of the things I, I want to be very clear about is that if, if the work we do is for careerism, then I don't have any advice because mm. I've never worked towards that, you know, but that is a very, that is a huge train, trend in academia. People are training their, the people that are coming behind them as mini-me's, you know, so dissertation advisors have students who do their research that are mini-me versions of themselves. So, and they're speaking to a larger you know, white liberal audience, you know, instead of talking to their own people, if they are doing culturally grounded work, you know, and I can't speak to that because then we will, I'll just sit here and do heavy critique the whole time. But I do want to point out that, um, you know, that's not where I'm coming from. I, I'm not coming from where you can say like, oh, if you just do these five things, you're going to have these sorts of heights in career, because I never now navigated it that way. I, you know, I navigated it with a sense of calling towards what my students were doing and how, how I could help them do the work that is meaningful for them and then what is meaningful for my own work. So to that end, you know, I do qualitative research and I'm a qualitative methodologist. So, so the first thing I would say if people are doing methods work, you know, and they're coming from a cultural perspective, then to not use people like Creswell, Maxwell, Patton, and I'm naming them right now because it's important to name that. And I'm, I'm, I, and I'm naming it because Creswell, Maxwell, Patton, these are white folks who have been privileged enough and are centered and write introductory texts, which are often very watered down. So if you're going to use their methods in your critical black feminist narrative inquiry study, then you are already out of sync with the ontopistemological orientation you bring to the table. Creswell, Maxwell, Patton, don't give a shit about what your stuff is, you know? So they are selling books and you are saying that your methodological understanding is at an introductory level, Reader's Digest introductory level. So it doesn't, and qualitative research, the strength of qualitative research is in-depth understanding. You are creating critical insight that you otherwise wouldn't have unless you had gone deep into some, some form of inquiry, people's lives or discourses or media or something else, you know. Mm -hmm. And so if you're gonna go in depth and you're claiming you're getting in depth understanding, but you're using methodological approaches that are introductory level methodological approaches, there's already a cognitive dissonance there. There's a, there's a misalignment there, but that's what gets promoted a lot of times in many schools that, you know, that these are the folks you go to, these are the go-to folks. And while I, while I think that there is merit to wrapping your head around a complex um, field of inquiry, like qualitative research with some of these texts, I think 
that I would advise folks to go deeper and find people that are culturally situated and have methodologies that are culturally situated methodologies. Now, the question then becomes, who are these people? And that's, a, that's the, the bigger challenge because a lot of times we don't give ourselves permission to do this unapologetically culturally situated work because we have academic gatekeepers who say this is not valid, this is not legitimate, it, this is too folksy, this is too anecdotal, this is this, you know, where is the precedent for it, you know. So one of the ways that I help my students navigate that is, you know, ask them to start with a disruptive theory you know, or a disruptive onto epistemology. Mm -hmm. So if you say my theory is black feminist narrative, you need to be able to breathe and dream and eat and sleep black feminist narrative so that you know it so well that whenever somebody challenges you as to why did you do this? Why did you have a, why did you have a circle of women just chatting and interrupting each other and going at it in an extremely nonlinear way and you called it like circle chats? You know, and you didn't have, you didn't call it focus group, you didn't call it in interviews, you called it circle chats or whatever other name that is culturally relevant for you to call it, you called it that, then you begin to put in your black feminist thought and say, the reason I did this is because of this, 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 it has to be theoretically congruent for this. And this is one structure that I think academia hasn't morphed. Academia has not morphed theory yet, you know? So they don't morph onto epistemologies or theories that much because they think that, because they had already created a divide between theory and practice. So they've already created this device that the sophisticated ones do theory and we in the gutter and the ghettoized folks, we are just, you know, in the muddy territory of practice. Right. So it's a way to disrupt that tool. You know, it's a way to disrupt that structure to say, nah, our theory looks like this, even if it doesn't sound like Foucault, Derrida, or other dead white French folks, we're theorizing from the streets. And right. so that means that we're going to, we're going to come up with a disruptive theory. And then we're going to say this disruptive theory plays out methodologically this way. What that means is sometimes you have to look at who else is doing this work and we have to create very robust social network of it where we continuously cite and celebrate and brand each other's work because if we don't, if we don't do that and broadcast that, that, mainstream academia won't do that either. So that's why I'm in my space you'll see I'm continuously broadcasting other people's work because we need to have the sort of, you know, um, literacy around what, what are other people doing. And then the other thing Thing I would say is um, we have to do um, things where when we are making up stuff, we have to be aware that we're making up stuff and we have to be very theoretically grounded when we are making up stuff. But it's okay. It's absolutely okay to make up your own methodology if you come from a disruptive theoretical space and you know why you're doing that. And so when people, when people ask you questions, and I wanted to do these two questions that come up quite a bit in, in dissertation defenses and in reviews and things like that. So the questions are, um, how do we know that this is the truth and it's not something that's coming out of your agenda or your biases? You know, and we talked about that. So I just wanna, I just wanna give a very solid answer to what I train my students to do. And then I'm gonna talk about when they call you angry, like what, what might be an answer to that? You right. know, so the first one is how do we know whether this is the truth and you're, you're not biased and you have an agenda? So the answer is, I don't know whether it's the truth, I am not chasing truth. Everybody has an agenda. NSF has an agenda, broadening participation, hello. You know, all our research has an agenda. Nothing is value neutral. And therefore, I'm not giving you the truth. What I am giving you is a co-constructed narrative with my participants. And I'm writing these narratives because these narratives don't currently exist. And I'm doing social documentation of history because if I don't write these narratives, somebody else will write it for us. Whether you believe in the, in the veracity of these narratives, it's up to you. I can't convince anybody to believe what I write. What I can do is show you the, the due diligence, the ethical uh, orientations, and the sensibilities that inform this. Then it's up to you whether you want to believe that this is the truth or it's not the truth. But we don't, we, I am not moving towards truth, I'm moving towards documenting social history as it's happening and creating narratives with participants as, it, as it's happening. And it's not necessarily I'm chasing a finite truth. I'm not chasing that truth, mm -hmm. you know, because I wouldn't know if I see it. 
Like, I, how would I know that this is a finite truth and I'm going to hold on to this? You know, so I wouldn't know. And then whose truth do we privilege? Which we know whose truth we have privileged so far. So right. this, is a, this is a privileging of other truths that haven't given, been given space. So when I'm in a position to create space, I'm going to create space at, for truths that haven't been centered yet or have been poorly centered you know so so that's you know so that's one of the things that um i continuously tell people to push back against you know and push back against that sort of um, um sort of uh, very positivist things the other thing i want to talk about is um why are you angry it sounds like you're really angry and if that comes up what you need to then do is you need to outline all the different ways in which the social structures of oppression are operating on the a group of people that you're working with, not working on, working with, right? So you, you start talking about this is happening every day. My people are on their road. There, is more, there are more people incarcerated right now than there were slaves. You know, you list these, these sorts of things that are going on and you say, why doesn't it make you angry? So flip the script. You don't have to defend your anger. Anger is an indication of empathy for suffering. So you say, why don't you have the empathy for suffering? Why are you able to maintain such a neutral stance when your fellow human beings are being treated in this sort of dehumanizing way? Where is your anger about this? So flip the script on that, you know? So anyway, I'll stop there to see. Oh, oh one more thing. One more thing I want to talk about. Yeah. And this one is hard. This one is really hard. So I'm going to have to write an article about this so that people can cite and, and have a citational um, precedence to it. But this one is really hard. So a lot of times we, we set up our dissertations and proposals and stuff in such a way where we say we have to have our research questions and hypotheses and, and assumptions and methods and theories and how are you going to collect data, analyze data, write up data, all of that set out in advance. That's a very positivist way of doing inquiry. A lot of colorly situated inquiry doesn't come from that. It comes from practice. We have practices, we engage in practice practices and our practices and our conversations with our elders and cultural other cultural community members that inspires the way we want to do inquiry and how we want to do inquiry so perhaps we have to rethink how we set up our research instead of setting it up like you know in 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 very white positivistic kind of way and to set it up as you know a community practice based inquiry and and we talk about the practice we talk about communal relationship we talk about you know ways in which we are accessing cultural capital you know we talk about those things and then we say that will emerge that will give us the emergent inquiry that we want to move towards or or that has given me the these things as my inquiry points without laying out the full blueprint of what are you going to do when you're going to collect data because i'm not sure that we know that none of us who have done research will say that exactly what they planned in advance is exactly how things had worked out so i it's an exercise in futility you know in and and so if we want to shift this, then we have to shift the method. These methods have not been created with us in mind. So we have to think about what, what would it look like if we didn't have academic guns pointed at us? Well, how might we do inquiry? What might be more organic and congruent way of doing inquiry and then create a structure around that for you? It doesn't have to be universally applicable, but it has to be argued that it, that it is culturally congruent. And that comes from the theoretical framing. You know, so any disruptive theoretical framing will give you the language for it. Mm -hmm. Please write this article. I will. <laughs> Hi, Rosemary. Listen, you you said academic guns, okay? Academic guns on us. Listen, <laughs> I love it. Right. <laughs> um, okay. I, right. Like I feel a little slightly speechless. Speechless in that. Um, you know, I've been in conversation, so my, um, my spirit sister and I, uh, Dr. Monali Chef, have recently been talking about um, epistemological violence, <laughs> and, then, and yeah. so as soon as you said academic guns, I was like, so go ahead and write that so that we can cite it when we are talking about the epistemological violence that is happening for women of color in the academy. So yeah, we need we're, we need that. <laughs> we need that piece. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. So we have um, a few questions here that have come 
from the audience, some of which are around getting your perspectives on particular kinds of methods, um, and mm -hmm. some are around, you know, getting some advice from you around navigating um, the academy in terms of as, you know, as a maybe pre-tenure um, person uh, in the tenure stream. So maybe we'll start here. Um, do you have particular thoughts on the role of discursive methods um, as it relates to uncovering issues of power and equity and oppression? And so there are examples, they said, for instance, your thoughts on like critical discourse analysis, narrative analyses as particular, I guess, methods uh, met or mm -hmm. methods. Yeah, methods. Yeah. Um, again, I would say I'll start with narrative and then I'll move into critical discourse analysis. I would say that um, I keep going back to like, what is what is your sensibility if the academic against were not pointed at you? You know, like, so if you're going to do narrative analysis, so right now I have a student who is working on a black feminist narrative inquiry, you know, and she's looking at sexuality and, um, and of older, older black women and how they, how they navigate sexuality and spirituality as older black, black women, you know, but we don't have, you know, narrative analysis methods that is culturally congruent to these, these women. You know, we don't have that. So I have to tell the student to just go and think about if, if you weren't having these guns pointed at you and you wanted to know this, what would you do to know this? How would you know this? And how would you inquire about it? And of course, her, her answer was, these are cultural elders. I would, be, I would be very humbled in terms of asking them. It wouldn't be, I would, I would go in to learn from them as opposed to extract data from them. You know, and so then that creates a very different type of receiving information as opposed to extracting data. Mm -hmm. and, and to do that, we then had to construct a narrative analysis um, sort of uh, structure that we didn't find in existing literature. So what we did then was we looked at black women's storytelling. So I made her go read all sorts of novels that black women had written. And she's looking at Toni Morrison and Maya Angelou and all sorts of black women's novels that she has, uh, that, that we have. And look at the tropes and how storytelling gets done in those spaces and how are we, um, how, things, how themes come up in those tropes, you know? And using that as a structure, we now move towards the narrative analysis of it. So again, it really goes back to like, why are you trying to do this work? What is calling you for it? And what is your orientation to it? So if it's black feminist orientation, so you have to know the orientation to it. So, so now, now let's go to critical discourse analysis. If you are going to do, let's say, a power knowledge analysis of a policy, right, but you want to cite Foucault for that, you know, that's fine, but you're going to have to realize that Foucault is a, is a hella privileged guy. I mean, that dude was rich, but he was gay, you know, so then he just started looking at all the power knowledge stuff, which is fine. But if you are going to look at it from a cultural perspective, if you are going to look at like how are policies in higher education um, affecting students of color or documented students, then you're going to have to look at how folks that are um, situated in those spaces think. So go to Du Bois, go to other people that can give you a way of thinking that can frame the analysis. So my, my guide, you know, and my advice to people would be to figure out like, who does this work for? Who is your audience? You know, is your audience a broad liberal academia or are you really committed to the people that you're working with so if you're really committed to the people that you're working with then generate epistemological ontological sensibilities and structures from that location you know and that may not be not always the, those sorts of you know thinkers are in academic spaces because academia is a gatekeeping space they, they they don't always legitimize everybody's publications and work as academic so you're you also have to think about expanding and thinking about who else can we cite that's also beyond academia if we say we're theorizing from the streets then we need to cite people from the streets so if that means you cite rappers poets singers you cite them you know you use those sorts of thinking to bring back into the fold and legitimize that so that you're not um holding up this boundary of who is in and who is out. You're messing up that boundary as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. 
So in our previous conversation, uh, we had, you had also right, talked about this idea of who we're citing, and, and you've written about this and spoke about this in other spaces. Um, and so, of course, right, by you saying that, multiple folks have then asked the question, well, if not citing them, then who? And I feel like part of what you just shared with us answers some of that, but maybe you have some more specific thoughts around if we're not, you know, citing these acceptable folks, right? Like, if, if specifically with regard to, like, inquiry practices, who would we cite? Yeah. Um, there are plenty of people that are doing a lot of good work, you know, it really depends on where your work is located, you know, so if you are doing like the Django Paris does a lot of ethical social, um, you know, social justice oriented methodological work, you know, obviously I do it too, um, you know, when Gloria Letson Billings first started doing the work, she did it there, Patricia Hill Collins does, um, nice social justice work um so so there are, it just depends on which which uh framing you're coming from you know like what is your framing where are you coming from and what what we don't have when i will say this what we don't have is a lot of folks doing methodological work and that's what we don't have because a lot of folks are called to do the, the substantive work and what i have seen is People are doing very tight theorizing, very tight, tight, you know, conceptualization of and literature review of all of the different ways oppression is working on different types of bodies, intersectional um, oppression. But then when you get to methods, we are, we're still using a very whiteness focused methods, you know, Creswell Patton, Maxwell type methods. And, and it's, it's in that space I'm disrupting because those methods are not culturally neutral, historically neutral, or value neutral, they're located. They're very socioculturally located and they're never meant for us. So if we keep using it and legitimizing it, then we are not using it for our own benefit. So I think like when we, I think if you look at journals like Qualitative Inquiry and International Journal of Qualitative Studies in Education, use, use your theoretical perspective or use your population to um, pull up people who are doing method stuff. Both of those journals have, you know, a high focus on methods. So it just depends on what you're doing. If you're doing autoethnography, there are folks that are doing critical autoethnography. Robin Boylan is doing autoethnography. David Cachella does critical autoethnography. There are folks that are doing very good, very good autoethnographic work as well, speaking from their own locations. So it just depends on, you know, what kind of work you want to do. Um, and this is all has has me even more fiercely committed to finishing this book I'm trying to write for Sage, you know, on critical qualitative methods because people are struggling. Who do we cite? You know, who do we cite and where do we go to? There are anthologies that have been put out by Sage called Decolonial and Critical Indigenous Methodology. There's a huge anthology of that. You can use that to look at that. Linda Tuihai Smith's work is very fiercely decolonizing. You can look at her work as well. But if you're really new and, and these names are sort of like blurry, then I would suggest going to Qualitative Inquiry or International Journal of Qualitative Studies in Education and start typing words that are relevant to your work, population work, theory work, analysis work, and you'll see work that comes up that are situated that way and you can use your discernment whether or not that fits mm -hmm. yeah um there is a good question coming from some friends and colleagues down in texas here in the chat i don't know if you saw that um around are there risks of methods becoming in too institutionalized um, yes yeah yeah, very much so. Um, and, and as a methodologist in, in uh, dissertation committees, that's what ends up happening a lot is people are looking for those institutionalized methods and they're looking for all of those structures, this structure, and then they want this structure, then, then you do this and then you do this. And then you know that if you're going to do this work, then first you're going to interview, then you're going to observe, then you're going to have documents, then you're going to code, then you're going to Thema thematized and you're going to write thematic narratives and what it does is well that's a path and that can be a path for some research that would be really appropriate um, 
it sort of sucks the juice out of the lived experiences and, and sucks the juice out of what you're really trying to do. Um, and and if you're if you're doing critical work, there has to be some goal in there to signal boost the the type of material suffering that people are ex experiencing and signal boost it in such a way that you can be provocative and evocative about it. You know, so to be to have signal boosting ways of doing this, we can't always do it the exact same way because the structure morphs itself too. So we're going to have to continuously morph and shift and evolve with the structure. And it's not that if you did, did this five things, now you have signal boosted, mm -hmm. you know, but the signal boosting is really important. You want to have signal boosting way. You want to have ways to signal boost your work because you want to signal boost because the people who are not in the body of that person isn't feeling it the way the person is experiencing and navigating their lives. And you as a researcher, you're one person removed from that if it's not autoethnographic. Mm -hmm. So then you have that obligation to really signal boost the emotional truths, the spiritual truths, the material truths, the, the other personal truths that are coming out. And the methods through which you get there doesn't have to be conventionally established methods. It has to be congruent to the framing, your own sensibility and on epistemic framing. It has, doesn't have to be, you know, I did it because narrative inquiry told me to do it. You know, it, it has to be bigger than that because you want the work to live and you want the work to live beyond the dissertation and beyond that, that one pub. You want it to have significance. Mm -hmm. Um, let's take one more question and then, um, so again, as I mentioned earlier, there are a lot of questions around navigating particular, um, maybe to use language that's been used in this space already, like, uh, to navigate particular gatekeepers. Um, and so, you know, there's a question around both navigating that in the tenure, um, in the publication process when, right, the journal editors or reviewers want you to use something familiar to them. And the example th this person gave was saying, you know, don't use testimonial methodology, for example, but use someone, you know, just say in-depth interviews instead of saying I'm using testimonial or, you know, or another mm -hmm. keeper being like IRB. And so how do you get IRB, right, to understand the creative process that you're trying to go yeah well this person used this language of the creative work with critical methodologies and so do you have some thoughts on as you think about the different the various gatekeepers um how folks can still do the work that they need to do and move forward um with their with their scholarship yeah um I was, you know, my, my advisor in Georgia was um, IRB chair, so I was very um, exposed to IRB politics at a very, as a very young academic. Mm -hmm. And my first article that I wrote was uh, IRB focused in qualitative inquiry. They had a special issue and mine was called Consenting to the Consent Form. And it's still to this day, my most cited article. And I was like straight out of graduate school. Um, so just, just a small note to that is that knowledge making can happen from any space, even, even as a recent graduate, even a recently graduated person can have just as solid knowledge making as somebody who's been in the space for a long time. Um, so IRB, you know, the way I navigate IRB is just a hoop to go through because the ethics with which IRB operates is not the same ethics with which we do critical work. You know, our ethical benchmarking is way higher and way more sophisticated and way more complicated. The neoliberal university only cares that you don't get sued. You know, right. they, they don't, they don't, they just care that you're treating your participants in a way that was not, that's not going to make it vulnerable for you getting sued. So in, in that con con construct, I give IRB the least amount of information needed, nothing, no deception or anything, but I don't get into the nuance of all the ways in which I am ethically considering all of the different relational dynamics because IRB doesn't care. IRB cares, have they consented? Do they know what they have to participate in? And are you clear about the purpose and risks and benefits and anything that you're going to give them as an incentive? You know, that's what they want to know. Now, where it gets really problematic is when we work with communities that don't understand consent, because consent is a very white colonial thing. You know, a lot of us do consent very differently. You know, and that's when 
when it gets problematic. So finding a way to bridge those worlds just so the IRB will just be satisfied, satiated with some sort of consent, you know, and then doing consent that looks culturally congruent, you know, is, is the bridge work that we all have to do, you know, and, and especially if we are in those IRB spaces, we can certainly, you know, um, sort of um, disrupt it from within and say, this doesn't make sense. I know people that did work with indigenous folks and the cultural elders wouldn't give consent because why would they? Look, tons of violence has been done on them, you know, in the name of research. Why would they give consent? None of them were giving consent. So I remember one of my peers at that time had to go through so much stuff, you know, and, and finally they advocated for, you know, by allowing her to come to the reservation, that was consent, not something in writing, you know? So, so we had to, we have to kind of, we have to kind of figure out like, how do we reconceptualize this? And if there's a way to build a bridge between between the very basic is looking for with you know something that looks like you don't have to you know give up your integrity that's the shared interspace in which we would navigate now when it comes to um and it's not easy it's, it's I'm, I'm giving it as an easy answer but it's very messy to do that work you know it's it's very messy it's a lot of like um um lot of back and forth, a lot of, you know, energy draining, spirit draining work. So, um, so the, the, the antidote to that would be to continuously have spirit nurturing practices as well while you're doing the spirit draining work. Um, but the other part of this is the reviewer part, you know, well, the reviewers can sometimes be real jerks. I mean, even if you did it with standard, you know, formatting and everything, I have a colleague who submitted this article three times and each time the reviewer has come back with methodological issues, different issues and finally methodological issues and the methodology was really standard qual stuff. So reviewers can be jerks for so many different reasons, you know, and, and, and at some point you have to decide if that's the journal that is the home for the work that you want to do, because you will find a home, maybe not always exactly where you want the home to be, but you will find a home and, and the home will come. Don't, don't give up on the fierceness of the, the work that you're doing to compromise with a reviewer. You know, where it doesn't take away from your work, sure, you know, be adaptive and flexible because um, sometimes you want to insert yourself into a space where not, nothing like your work has been inserted and I've certainly done that, you know, and so in doing that, I've compromised a little bit with reviewers so that my work would be in that space so that other people can say, hey, you publish work like this, so now publish my work too, you know, so I've done th things like that, you know, but I've one of one of the pieces that I published, um, you know, in a journal, it was by by round three, and I'm talking like this happened in 2016. So I've already been in this game for a while, and I had a reviewer who had given me such racist, racist feedback, and I had pushed back. And I don't think the managing editor or the editor was read, reading other than status quo stuff. So the final one, I wrote back like about two pages, single spaced, you know, push back on it. And next thing you know, it got accepted, you know? So if you read that article, you will find like my tone is different. Like some places I'm, I'm, it feels like I'm really fierce and some places it just feels like, uh, and that's because there were, there've been like a few rounds of reviews that have been done, but now people have that. And like, I went to AERA and I found like a bunch of people were citing that article and then I'm like, okay, this is good. I mean, this is why I did this. This is where that, that sort of shared interest space and interest convergence space was helpful to identify. But I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't compromise on, on the stuff that is really important to the article. You know, I would push back. I would, I would, without taking down a reviewer, there are ways of saying that. There could be, I think reviewer two might have misread this portion and uh, my feedback, my, my orientation to this work came from this, therefore I'm compelled to do the work in this way. Mm -hmm. You know, anything else would take away from the purpose of this work, blah, blah, blah. You know, there are ways of pushing back where you don't have to completely be, um, you know, absolutely going on on war path with a reviewer but you can still hold your ground firm and say this is what i'm doing sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't you know and and that's where you have to kind of continuously look for other spaces so what i do and did i didn't i don't anymore because i i'm i just have crazy schedule at aera and the conferences but conferences where 
journal editors come to the conference, you know, where journal editors are typically from the conference, I would, and I would interview journal editors. I would go into the journal editor circles and I would interview journal editors and do a qualitative interview of them, five minutes, not much. And I would say questions like the last time you rejected an article and how, and what were your reasons? What are your biggest pet peeves? You know, how do you find, how do you approach conceptual articles? How do you approach empirical articles? How do you approach logical articles? These are things that are not on the website. So once I do that and I, you know, talk about my piece or my work and that I would make a note myself. So at one point I had a whole Excel sheet with journal editors, journal names, their time frame of how, how long they take to do the reviews and their pet peeves. And then I would go back to my university and I would, you know, sort of write them back and tell them that I thank them for their time and this, and I'm planning on sending them if I am, you know, a certain article. But I got on the radar of people, you know, editors that way. And I had a sense that if, if this journal didn't take this, then I would go to this other journal or this other journal. So I had to do some research on that. And I think we all have to do that kind of research. Or the other thing is to look at our colleagues' Vita and see where they're publishing similar work. Then you know that those journals are friendly to the work that you know you are doing as well. Yeah, awesome. Can well, you I want share to the of our time. Um, and so I have one more question and I have some final thank yous. Um, so as you may be aware, some woke identified folks like to wear message t-shirts. So if there was a t-shirt designed with who you are and what you stand for in mind, what would it read? Well, you know, I um, my Twitter handle has now become Queen B because um, people can't say my name properly. So, you know, I, I also said like, you know, when I go for Starbucks coffee, well, now I'm not gonna go to Starbucks anymore, but you know, when I used to go for coffee, um, they would uh, not say my name right. And when they wouldn't say my name right, I wouldn't uh, know that my coffee is there and I would get my coffee very cold because I couldn't recognize that they were actually calling my name out. Mm -hmm. So I started using Queen, Queen B as my name. So if I had a t-shirt, I would say Queen B, warrior monk, you know, and warrior monk, because on one hand, you know, I, I come from a place of, I want to come from a place of kindness and, and grace and, uh, you know, and generosity of spirit and love, you know, and those things are very endemic to who I am. Yeah. But at the same time, I have to have certain boundaries up because other people like, you know, could, could cross those boundaries. And, and so, so when I fight for social justice issues and, and people who cross boundaries and stuff, then I get into my fierce warrior self. So those, those two things are, you know, sometimes uh, very compatible and also contradictory. So my partner calls me warrior monk. So it's can be warrior monk. All right. Well, with that, I'll say thank you for joining us, Dr. Queen Bee Warrior Monk. <laughs> I'm grateful <laughs> to you for sharing your knowledge and wisdom with us. I'd also like to thank those who have been working to ensure this series happens. At Indiana University, doctoral candidate Bernice Sanchez, doctoral student Wendy Ferguson, and master's student Elise Smith. Also, doctoral students Melanie Harris at Clemson University and Naya Grimes at the University of Georgia. If you miss Lee Patel and can't get enough of Kakali, this these are being recorded um, and they're adding closed captioning and should be available within the next week or two and can be accessed through the webinar registration site. As mentioned at the beginning of this webinar, this is a series. I hope folks can join me on Wednesday, May 16th from noon to 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. For those of us who are interested in the relationship between quantitative methods, critical race theory, intersectionality, and praxis, this one's for you. Our guest will be Dr. Alejandro Covarrubias. And lastly, we hope that you can all join us as a member or visitor for ASH 2018, November 14th through the 17th in Tampa, Florida. Call for proposals are out and due next Friday, May 4th. You can also register and volunteer to serve as a reviewer, discussant, and session chair by visiting www.ashe.ws and clicking on the conference button. Again, thank you so much, Dr. Kakali Bhattacharya. We appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.